Thank you very much and very good morning to you. I'll be switching to English and uh, speaking to you and uh, I hope, uh, I'm sure you understood the gist of uh, the story uh, told by uh, Mr. Anoja Virasinghe. Thank you very much, Anoja. Uh, my topic is on empathy and compassion and I'm going to link this to the story she related. And uh, the idea is to extract from that story the principles of empathy and compassion and ask ourselves the question whether we can cultivate compassion or empathy. So that's going to be the outline. And uh, if you look at the examples related by her, on the left is the event. As a single mother, I couldn't take medicine and sleep till late. Some days I had to leave for shooting of films very early. And the response by the doctor is given on the right. The smile, the encouragement, and uh, how she seems to have read the mind of An uh, Anoja and told, you know, you can get out of the depression. You can take responsibility for your life. And also gave her some tips as to how she could move with people who are giving positive emotions so that she comes out of the depression. Then we take the next example. I will manage only with a diet. And the doctor sensed, the consultant sensed that she doesn't want to take tablets. So that's why he went on another way of convincing her how important she is as a person to us and requesting her very kindly to take the tablets. And not only that, he informed the rest of the hospital staff whom she, he knew so that uh, she will be supported by them. Not a breaking of conf confidentiality, but here was an instance where he spoke to the staff so that they will care for her in a very gentle way. So these two events, uh, in fact, uh, have a lot of meaning because uh, when we try to define these terms like empathy and compassion, we have to try and understand what's going on. As human beings, uh, we have what we call the theory of mind. We are able to read what the other people are thinking and what other people are uh, what their emotions are. And in fact, evolution-wise, that might have been the key for our success. Because in evolution, we know that the Neanderthal, they were stronger than us, they had bigger brains, but they didn't cooperate. It was our cooperation with each other that helped us to be so successful. So when people say that we have to be competitive and it's survival of the fittest, that's a wrong interpretation of evolution. It's of a cooperation and the fact that we are humane that has made us successful. And this has been argued in a book by Ritke on the humaneness of human beings with a lot of research. Okay, so, so that's the theory of mind. And linked to that is empathy, where you feel like the other one. You understand by feeling like the other one, other person, or compassion, which is not only feeling about the other person or understanding, but you try, you're motivated to help. Altruism goes a bit further, a lot further. So metta, and metta meditation goes further because there you are spreading your compassion irrespective of the person you know. So in metta meditation, you go from the people you know, the people you hate, the people around you, the whole world, all animals, all living beings, etc. So your compassion is moving beyond the focus of an individual. So for you to read these,
So that's understanding through feelings that are similar to someone else's feelings. And empathy, you can, there are, now they describe uh, empathy, cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. So you can understand another person's perspective without really feeling also. Whereas the emotional part is your having your feeling like what the other. So when the other person is sad, you're feeling sad. So when the first patient under your care during internship died, I cried because I was feeling the same way that that person's child was feeling. I re recognize myself in that person's shoes. So that's an effective path. And I briefly described these also. So empathy, compassion, and altruism. Now the interesting thing is these are not uh, you know, things we just imagine. There is neurophysiological basis, and that's the thrust we, are, we have made at the Faculty of Medicine in Colombo by trying to link all this to the neurophysiology because we love biomedical explanations. So this came about when they discovered what we call mirror neurons. It was actually an experiment which ran, which you know, was, got messed up because they had EEGs on, stuck on uh, monkeys in the laboratory and they were trying to see the patterns of ECG, EEG with various activities. Uh, one common activity was where they gave a banana to the monkey and you record what the EEG patterns were. This was days before functional MRIs. And one day, without giving the, the EEG was tagged on to the monkey, but uh, without the monkey being given the banana or the plantain, the technician was hungry and technician ate it. But the monkey was watching. And then they discovered that the EEG pattern was very similar to the EEG pattern when the monkey had the banana. So it was as if the brain was mirroring when someone else is doing a certain activity the brain is able to mirror that and feel for it. So now you will see how mirror neurons will help, will explain the theory of mind as well as empathy and compassion. So that was a, that's a neurophysiological basis. And now we have functional MRIs. And they have, in fact, identified areas which light up with functional MRIs with compassion and it seems to be different from areas which light up when you have empathic response. So there's a neurophysiological basis. This is not something which, uh, you know, we are doing something nice. That's not the, uh, re uh, that's not the basis of it. And uh, in fact, this has now extended to the arts and there's enough and more research to show how the arts and humanities are linked to the same areas. So if you want to become more compassionate and empathic, introducing the arts and humanities would play a role because you have a neurophysiological basis in addition to research evidence. So we get on to this question of cultivating compassion. So we were struggling with this in Colombo when we established the very first Department of Medical Humanities in Sri Lanka. And uh, we had several discussions, even Eugene and Arosha, both of them spoke uh, during these, uh, the, child, the infant stage of the department. Uh, they came and spoke to us about aspects related to humanities. And we had this international conference in 2018. Uh, and the topic was learning to be more humane, the role of medical humanities. And we discussed this over a period of two or three days. And we, in fact, had a workshop, one of the first workshops where we got artists and uh, other people from the medical profession to, sp to speak 
to each other. And of course, during this time, Professor Carlo Fonseca, who reflects these two cultures, who combined these two cultures, was with us and he played a key role. Oops. And this was the program and this was the model. Basically, this is a model which we have developed of using the arts, mindfulness, and so on to make a person more compassionate, more caring, uh, and a better human being. So if I were to go into a few more details, uh, we have opportunities for meditation also in the faculty now. And uh, we have just opened the Research Center for Meditation, and there are five PhDs working on this area. And in relation to introducing the arts, from it being a mere extracurricular activity, we have brought it into the curriculum. That's the idea. In, in a small way, we are bringing it into the curriculum. And we've used things like narratives now, what Anuja's story is a narrative of a patient, of a person, of a human being. And you bring those in so that you become sensitive to other points of view. You bring in the visual arts, music, literature, poetry, drama, and so on. And again, in 2022, November 23rd, we are having the Colombo Medical Congress, and there's a whole stream on humanities. So we are having live artists drawing portraits, we have sculptures, uh, we'll be launching the Colombo Medical Orchestra, we'll be launching the Colombo Medical Choir, and uh, so many other activities which bring in the humanities. So in a few more details, narrative-based learning is where you ask students or learners to write a novel or a short story not history and examination, not a clinical diagnosis, not that. You must specifically tell them, don't write a diagnosis, just get their story. And it must be from the patient's own language. You lose things in translation. I think that's a major problem we have in our medical profession. Uh, we are bilingual in the wrong direction. If we were bilingual in Sinhala and Tamil, I think most of our problems would have vanished. But uh, we are unable to capture that essence when we translate. You have to get them to write it in Sinhala, write it in Tamil, and there are enough volunteers in a batch who will translate it to those who don't understand. Right? So that's something we do. And uh, they also write narrations of illness because their concepts of illness are totally different. So Anoja said, I don't want to take tablets. Now, unless you tackle that, you address that, she's not going to take tablets. And uh, so it's similar to an alco person who is taking alcohol, who comes and says, I peveno, as if the bottle comes and glug, glug, glug. No, they drink it. But anyway, if you start scolding them, they will not listen to you. You have to be on their side. And that's key to good, compassionate care. So narrative-based learning, where we get people to write narrations. And again, the college has taken a lead in having storytelling sessions. And congratulations, uh, Ganaka, for that. We get them to read short stories and come and comment uh, and critique them uh, during uh, their student seminars. And the field is wide open. We get them to read poetry and uh, come and tell what they felt. What would the patient have felt? What would the husband of the patient who is given here, who is a poet, what would he have felt when his wife was dying and was getting chemotherapy? and uh, ask them to view films. This is on compulsive uh, OCD, a patient who is having obsessive compulsive disorder who directed this film. 
and uh, he comes out with uh, his whole film shows how much he suffered. We get, get them to look at art and comment on what the artist was perceiving or what the artist was trying to express and uh, so on. And there is enough literature on this. If you, it's, it's based on literature, systematic reviews and so on. So in summary, I've tried to take the example narrated by Anoja and try to extract empathy and compassion, showed you the neurophysiological basis and a few tips on how we can cultivate uh, uh, compassion. And uh, the path which you have to take is difficult. Uh, it's not a clear path, and, uh, but I call upon all of you to join the college uh, to produce more human, humane health professionals. And once again, congratulations, Ganaka, and uh, thank you for inviting me.